Nicholas Stewart here uh, with the African Tech Roundup again. I'm here on the fourth day of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Today I'm joined by uh, Steve Perlman, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Artemis. Thank you for joining us, Steve. Glad to be here. Uh, would you tell our listeners at the African Tech Roundup uh, a little bit about your company? Yeah, so we're a startup based in San Francisco, and we've developed a technology that allows you to very inexpensively deploy extremely high capacity LTE, Wi-Fi, and fixed wireless. In fact, it even supports uh, new wireless protocols as they come forward. And um, it achieves much higher capacity than conventional technology. For example, in San Francisco, we're achieving 50 times the capacity of LTE in the same spectrum that you would get through a conventional LTE system. And very significantly, it's very, very inexpensive. It's much less expensive to deploy. Hmm. What would you equate this technology to? Are you replacing a Wi-Fi router? Are you replacing uh, fiber itself? Well, so the first u users of it would be um, for mobile, which would be you know LTE, you know, sure. uh, which currently is deployed using very expensive cellular systems. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, uh, the, the radios that we're using are actually smaller than a Wi-Fi router. They're about the, soul, the size of a, a roll of Lifesavers candy, you know, mm. and uh, the uh, um, and you can just, they're so small that you can uh, string them together in a daisy chain and then wrap them in a cable and then, you know, string them between utility poles, put them along the edges of roofs or, you know, or put them in the roof of a building indoors and so on. Mm. And then wherever you deploy them, you will then have LTE coverage in whatever band you like and within the range of Wi-Fi, which doesn't go quite as far. Sure. And you, of course, will have Wi-Fi coverage. And um, also, you know, if you don't have, say, cable modem or DSL service, you'll also have what's called fixed wireless coverage of a little router in your home, which will then receive it and then provide Wi-Fi coverage in your home. Um, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday I heard you mention a company in the Bay Area that you guys are partnered with on the fixed point uh, yes, side? Yes, a company called WebPass. Okay. It's a... Um, they were just acquired by Google, if I they recall were. correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so where do you guys find yourself in the infrastructure chain of that uh, system? So we've developed... Um, the way our system works is rather than have um, the computation part that figures out how the radio waves go out. Instead of having it in the radio, we actually have servers that can be nearby. They can, you know, anywhere within 10 kilometers, but, you know, if it's in a building, it could be in a telephone closet, it could be in a data center. They're just conventional Intel motherboards running Linux and our software. Hmm. And then what comes out of there through the network, through, say, Ethernet or fiber or through, you know, a line of sight, you know, uh, microwave links, um, is the actual radio wave waveforms digitally. And then they come into our little radios, and the radios then send them out. Mm -hmm. Of course, they receive them and send them back digitally. So that way, all the upgrades and all the computation is back in the data center. Also, it dramatically lowers the cost of the system. Sure. Um, one of the things that I always like to ask is not just the what it is that you do, but why it is that, that you do it. What, what drew you to solve this problem uh, that you guys are, your technology is addressing? Well, you know, if you... Look around the consumer electronics show. Uh, we're seeing every imaginable kind of device that does this, that, or the other thing. But every one of them is relying on one thing, which mm. is connectivity. Mm. You've got to have good connectivity. And what has happened in the world is that um, um, in, in the developed world, we have so much use of our mobile networks and Wi-Fi networks that they're overwhelmed. Mm. So there's just so much congestion that we don't get good through. But in the developing world, uh, very often the cost of the equipment or the cost of deploying is just so high that they, again, can't get the infrastructure in. Sure. I mean, they may have tons of spectrum in a lot of undeveloped countries, but no one's able to afford the costs and justify the cost of putting in the high-end cellular equipment. So in both cases, there's huge need for connectivity, all right? And what we want to do is come up with a ubiquitous, low-cost, fast and easy to deploy system that can handle any level of density. Mm. And that's what we've developed with PSO. Mm. Uh, are you guys currently involved in any projects in uh, the con on the continent of Africa? Uh, not yet, but we've been contacted by different people in different countries. Um, one of the 
in fact, uh, it's it's not just Africa, but other areas that are are you know either remote or they're developing. They don't have a lot of infrastructure, like Cuba, for example. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we're just normalizing relations. Sure. And you go there, there's almost no infrastructure. So how do so they they have a clean slate? And normally, you'd say, well, that's kind of a disadvantage to developed countries. Well, in some ways it is, some ways it isn't, because they don't have sort of the, the baggage of all of the lower tech equipment that we currently have, say, in the United States. Well, You're able to skip over a few generations of technology. Exactly. And, I mean, when we look at what the huge impact that um, mobile voice had in the developing world, you know, just, say, 3G or 2G technology, I mean, how much did that change people's lives? And the thinking was, well, we should be able to skip over and never have DSL or cable modems, or rather have completely mobile data. Why not? Well, then they realized that mobile data doesn't scale well in the wireless world. You run out of capacity. The P cell that scales beautifully. So we think that in the developing world, they're going to have mobile data that's actually in some ways better than we have in the developed world. <laughs> and it'll be less expensive and it'll be ubiquitous and they'll never have any wires to hook up. And no matter how congested it is, and there's some very high density population areas, of course, um, it's still the case that everyone's going to get high speed connectivity. Steve, what's your background from a professional educational standpoint? Well, so I, I have a degree from Columbia University, uh, and uh, I guess people got to know me when I was at Apple Computers. Um, we were transitioning from the, the black and white Macintosh, for those who remember that thing, to the Color Mac. So I was part of the Color Mac team. Um, I developed QuickTime technology, which, you know, it, I see you're using an iPhone right here, an iPad. Yep. Well, when you play a video, if, way back when, it's actually this month is the 25th anniversary of QuickTime. Okay. And I'm also showing my age. <laughs> So I did some startups. Um, I developed something called Web TV. It was acquired by Microsoft. I became a president of Microsoft Corporation. And then I built their campus in Silicon Valley and developed all their video products, the Xbox 360. And when used it, came out of that team. The, um, um, you know, the IP television, their uh, satellite TV, their uh, cable TV products, and so on. Hmm. Uh, then I started an incubator called Reardon, which set out to develop very long-term technologies that maybe or maybe wouldn't pan out. And uh, one of the things uh, is P-Cell that was developed there. And believe it or not, it's been about 15 years of work to get it to this point. Okay. Yeah, that was actually one of my next questions was, uh, when did when did this idea come to fruition? Uh, or when did, it, when did the process begin of uh, this idea as a whole? And then when did you Walk us through the process, I guess, uh, is what so, I'm asking. So about 15 years ago, um, I was beginning to see the first uh, Wi-Fi routers and, and the first 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi routers that, that could go a little higher data rate. And I was thinking, oh, this is great. I think people are going to distribute video over wireless. I know it sounds crazy that back then that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi couldn't quite do it, but 5 gigahertz could because they didn't have all the protocols in there yet. And what I found was, okay, I can get a certain amount through, and then I'd hit some capacity limits. So I started doing experiments to see what limits there would be. Now, this is long before YouTube or any of the other things. So I just said, well, let's take all the broadcast television we have in the United States, which would be over the air, satellite, and cable. And I, let's take prime time, Friday night and everything, and see how much has to be transmitted. What happens if we go from broadcast to unicast, which is what's going to happen over the internet, you know, uh, transmission to individual users? And then let's see whether or not we can fit it into wireless. And then I realized that there's just not going to be enough spectrum. There's not enough capacity. Because if you go to very high frequencies in spectrum, there's certainly more spectrum up there, but it no longer penetrates walls. There's only a certain range that is efficient in penetrating walls. Sure. And so I met with then experts in every different field I could find in wireless to see what the peak improvement they projected ahead for, say, the next decade they could see. I knew a lot about video compression, so I knew where things were going with HDTV. And again, I did the math, and I found that we were about one one thousandth the amount of, of <laughs> spectrum was than, uh, than we needed. It was that far off. You know, check my numbers. Hmm. So, at that point, you know, what you want to do is just go and take an known technology and maybe improve it. You know, you don't want to over-engineer things. So then I. You know, it's kind of a Sherlock Holmes sort of thing. If you've explored every obvious answer, then you have to go and believe the answer is going to be in the non-obvious answer. And that was to come up with an entirely new way of using radio waves. So that's when I set out to go and do things. And we went through hundreds of iterations of different ideas before we finally arrived at what today is called P-Cell. 
which is a radical idea, which is instead of all the users sharing non-interfering radio waves and taking turns, instead what we do is we deliberately create interference from all the different radios and use that interference in it to combine the overlapping radio waves to synthesize a P-cell right at the antenna of each user device so that every user in the coverage area gets their own private tiny cell. And it turns out they're about a few millimeters in size. So the thing that everyone was avoiding since the invention of radio, which is interference, we are exploiting to increase the capacity of the spectrum. And what we are achieving now, as I mentioned before, is 50 times the capacity of LTE, completely compatible with existing LTE devices. Uh, talk a little bit about the functionality to the end user. Yesterday, when I saw you on the floor, you guys had a bunch of iPads set up. Mm -hmm. You were Skyping on, I don't know, 10 or 12 different That's devices right. at once. You were running 10 or 12 different YouTube videos. Talk a little bit about some of the benefit sure. to the end users. Well, let's say you're in a stadium. You're watching a game, and there's some amazing play, and everyone's got a mobile device, and then everyone wants to go and watch whatever the, um, the replay is, or maybe people want to uplink some videos or photos they have, okay? Well, there's a sudden demand on the wireless network at that point, okay? And what with all the networks that are available today, and if you've been in a stadium and you've experienced this, it just shuts down. I mean, you, you see a little spinning thing, maybe you lose your connection to the network. It gets pretty bad during those, those critical moments. Okay, what would happen with P-Cell? Well, what, we did, what you just saw, saw on the floor is if everyone suddenly makes a demand, or there I had 10 users all watching, we're playing, hitting the play button for YouTube, for HD videos at once. At that moment, it's fine, because with P-Cell, rather than everyone taking turns to share that combined radio spectrum, every individual device there gets to use the full capacity spectrum independently at once. And everybody will be able to upload your videos of the great play, or watch the replay, whatever you're doing, and you're not going to be interfering with the person sitting right next to you or anybody else in the state. That's amazing. Um, I'm assuming that the some of the upsides of your technology are undervalued by some of the folks in the U.S. that you talk to. Uh, my wife and I have visited uh, Swaziland uh, the past three year, uh, summers in a row, and one of the things that we notice there is that when our cell phones connect to a wireless network there sometimes the local cell phones end up getting kicked off the network because of the amount of traffic that we're taking up and things like that so the benefit to uh, the technology you're talking about for the developing world I think has some huge potential there yes it's one of the you know so yes you know I, I sure, certainly want to solve problems in the uh, developed world but one of the great things I mean one of the really satisfying things about working in technology is seeing how much of an impact it has on the lives of people in the developing world. And I truly think that this is a kind of technology that entrepreneurs, you know, sometimes who are microfunded, you know, or, or just people that are, that for whatever reason, there's different organizations help them. This brings broadband connectivity in reach of anyone, anywhere, okay? Uh, and certainly Africa is one of the, under, the least served uh, regions of the world when it comes to broadband connectivity. So when I think of, um, uh, so if we, you have entrepreneurs that will go and string these P-Wave minis up, you can find on the artnos.com website. Um, the servers can be leased, so they're not that expensive, you know, and you put them in, they can serve a lot of people at once. And you put them up there, and Anybody, then they can either sell SIM cards if they want, or if there's organizations want to give out the SIM cards, however the best, whatever model works best for a given situation, or if they're near enough, these things just use Wi-Fi, right? Uh, then people can get on, and now they are not just you know getting voice calls, they're not worried about kicking someone off of voice calls. They can do Skype calls, they can go and uh, uh, somebody who's motivated to get take a whole course in medicine, they can learn about medicine. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking of, you got a farmer who, I don't know, um, uh, has a, something to turn down, so they got some scrap metal, but they want to trade with somebody else who's got something else they need. These kind of, uh, you know, micro markets that can be created in communities, those can be enabled by communications. Suppose someone comes down with some unusual disease that the local, uh, 
you know, uh, medical folks just don't know how to treat with it. There's volunteers all around the world that would jump on a Skype call to look at what the rashes look like, whatever it is, you know, and they can go and help diagnose this and help that person. Or when that guy gets some of this metal that he traded for something else, an architect from somewhere can help them. And on top of that, maybe the, the guy's kid will listen in and learn about architecture and then make the thing himself or, or herself, you know, his daughter. Um, all these things become possible if we enable broadband communications widely throughout the world, and most notably in the African continent. Uh, Steve, you are speaking to my heart right now. Uh, the solutions that you mentioned are actually what's uh, uh, inspired the Swazi Bridge Project. You know, we, we always talk about knowledge being power. Well, if that's the case, then the Internet is the great equalizer because it contains all recorded human knowledge ever. Uh, and for us in the developed world, we have it at our fingertips. Uh, so bringing that to more areas around the world is something we're very passionate about and appreciate what you're doing to bridge a digital divide as well. Great. Uh, Steve, where can our listeners, uh, the African Tech Roundup podcast, find more information about what you guys are doing? At um, Artemis.com, A-R-T-E-M-I-S, just like the Greek goddess. She is a... Uh, um, the artist of the hunt and the artist of the moon so this is a bit of a moonshot what could I say <laughs> uh, we have some videos that show it there's a white paper there's some deep technical thing that people want to dig in with technology some people find that interesting and uh, of course we'll keep you posted as uh, things develop thank you again this has been uh, Steve Perlman uh, with Artemis and I'm Nicholas with the African Tech Roundup thank you